<laughs> Welcome everyone watching on the recording. I'm assuming live stream folks aren't in just yet, but good to have everybody. This is weird. I have a microphone. <laughs> Using a microphone for this class is odd. You know, I think I turned them off. We're odd. No, me using a microphone is odd. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started today because I don't know who thought I was going to teach this. But they thought we were going to get through a whole chapter of Genesis, which there's no way that that's going to happen. But um, in order to attempt to get through, see, they try to hide it by saying, read Genesis 3, 1 through 24. Well, there are only 24 verses in Genesis, so just read Genesis 3, save the ink, right? But... Um, <laughs> All that aside, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, today is the first day of our summer Sunday school. We've done something like this years ago. I think it was pre-COVID where we, uh, during the summer months, all meet together with the, the, well, as I said in the earlier service, young and old. Everyone's gathering here. So we got the kiddos with us today all the way up. And we're going to start together. We have a video um, that we're going to begin with. And I'll probably say something, right? Pastors like to talk. And then I'll hand it over to Emily to give more directions. Only directions. Okay. Only directions. Okay. But not, not, not just yet. Yeah, we'll wait till after the video for that. Um, so the, the Sunday school age kids and the youth are going to head off and do their study on their own. Uh, the youth have had enough of me for today. So they uh, gave me to all of you. Um, so that I get to teach uh, the adult class. It's a, a, a pleasure and a joy. Um, so without any further ado, um, let's watch our opening video, which I didn't test. So we'll see if it works the first try. Mm -hmm. It does help if you're on the right network. <laughs> See, this is why you're supposed to test things before you. Right, and you know what they teach you first to do is check and see if your volume's on, which it was not. Adam said the woman gave the fruit to him, and he ate. Eve told God how the 
serpent had tricked her. God told the serpent that one of Eve's children would destroy him. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He was talking about Jesus. On the cross, Jesus suffered for the sins of Adam and Eve, and ours, destroying Satan's power and winning eternal life for all who believe in him. Adam and Eve could no longer eat from Eden's tree of life, but Jesus' cross became the new tree of life for all of us. So the study that we are going to be embarking on today is going to be, or is called the Tree of Life. And the goal here is something that we've done before. There are lots of studies that do this. Um, but this is a study which seeks to follow what you could call that golden thread, or perhaps that crimson thread through Scripture. We're seeing the beginning of that today. Right? Whenever most of us, I would imagine, think of the fall, we think about who first? Adam and Eve. Right? And whether you think of Adam or Eve first, I'll leave that to you. Uh, but we think of Adam and Eve. Uh, what I want to challenge us to do, not only in this session, but really throughout everything, is let's look at the scriptures more through the lens of Christ. Um, I, I tell my confirmants all the time, right? Uh, we have this fun little game where I ask them what each book of the Bible is about, and they get really nervous because most of them haven't read most of the books of the Bible, right? So I, I start with an easy one, right? What is the book of Matthew about? One word. Jesus, Jesus right? What about, oh, uh, we'll do, what about the book of Romans? What's the book of Romans about? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, you guys are following or catching on real quick. Well, who's the book of Genesis about? Right? And, oh, here's a tricky one. What about Leviticus? Jesus. Now, you hesitated there, but it is, in fact, Jesus. Absolutely. No, so we, we see that all of the pages of the Scripture talk about Jesus. And that's exactly what this little video showed us, is that when we think about the fall, yes, thinking about Adam and Eve and the serpent and everything there, that's important. Those are pretty major things. Uh, points, plot points, if you want to talk in that way. But who we should really be seeing, the most important character is the one that's promised, right? That promised son of Eve, the one who will crush the head of the serpent. And of course, we know that that is Jesus. Well done, right? You're already awake. See, you get more response in here than you do in the sanctuary. That's, that's all right. Absolutely. So, we're going to see today and in all of these lessons that everything written down in the Bible is about Jesus, right? The end of the book of John, he kind of lays this out for us, right? These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that's the goal of this series. Today we're going to start doing that in the book of Genesis, specifically Genesis chapter 3. But before we dive in, we're going to dismiss our younger... No. We have something else that we need to do first that I was told and then forgot. So that is read Genesis chapter 3. So we'll not get just the, the short version, but we're going to read the whole thing. Um, tell you what. As a gift to all of you this morning, I'm, I'm just going to read it, read Genesis chapter 3 for you. Um, and if you're at the late service and my voice goes out during the prayers or something, this is why. So Genesis chapter 3. Now a serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So when the so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. And above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, we'll wait, go to Emily for directions. Now you get me. Well, thank you all. Um, so we're starting this Tree of Life congregational study. So what's happening is everyone's starting in here. Um, every Sunday where we'll have a short little video, read the Bible lesson, Bible, um, and then um, Pastor either Pastor Walensky or Pastor Jordan will kind of give an overview. Now, hey, and your timing is wonderful. At 10 o'clock, um, we are going to, <laughs> I was timing, yeah. Um, we're going to dismiss the children and the youth. Um, middle school and high school youth, you're going to go with, um, this week, Lindsay and Kenny. Um, and then the children, um, if you, you're going to go with Ms. Chabette and Mr. Ben. So, and Mr. Ben and Ms. Chabette, will you go stand over at the uh, um, doorway? And the children are going to be in the 78th room, and the high school and middle school are going to be in the high school room. So, parents... Um, please pick up your children at 1045, so there's another uh, stopping point for you, um, <laughs> over at the 78 room. So, children, will you please close your Bibles, and um, you can take them and put them back over by where um, Ms. Shabbat is, and you can follow them. And then the rest of y'all, enjoy your study. Thank you. And thank you not only to the volunteers who are teaching today, but also I know a number of you have signed up to help with uh, particularly the younger kids. I just roped Kenny and Lindsay into handling the youth on the few Sundays I can't be with them. But uh, if, you're, if you're helping out with any of the younger kids, thank you for that. Um, it's, uh, it will be a blessing to you, I'm sure, um, and it certainly will be a blessing to them. So thank you if you are volunteering either today or another day. 
So, we are looking uh, through what you could call narrative theology. Right? This is a very exciting thing. Uh, lots of professors and uh, writers are writing and teaching about it. Um, it is not a new way by any means to read the Bible. Um, it is simply a focused effort to look at the scriptures, look at the Bible, and say, hey, this looks like a story. Right? Which We all know that there are stories in the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, they're all true. I'm not saying this is a fictional thing, but... We know that there are stories, narratives in the scripture, but if you look at the entirety of the Bible, from beginning to end, you can look at it as if it is just one big, uh, not a novel, but in that sort of sense. You can see rising action, falling action, right? The, the stuff we learned about in middle and high school English classes, right? It's, it's going to come back with a vengeance, at least a little bit today. And so where we're going to start off is with, well, the setting, right? Genesis, more than Genesis 3, I mean, in many ways you could say the entire book of Genesis, but especially the first uh, 11 chapters or so, are setting the stage for the rest of scriptures. All right, how many of you have a Genesis commentary at home? How many of you have one that's more than one volume and it always breaks at chapter 11? If you, did, if you didn't know, if a Genesis commentary is more than one volume, 1 through 11 are the first volume, and 12 through 50 are the second. It's because 1 through 11 really are setting the stage of the entire Bible. Um, and so we're going to kind of look into that today. So what I want you to do, and we'll do this first part um, in small groups with your tables, um, is look at setting, right? And if you have the worksheets, this is question one, right? When, where, who, all those good, um, good questions. So work on specifically with Genesis 3, Genesis chapter 3, when is this taking place, where is it taking place, who are the characters, if you're going to use that term, um, and we'll work on that for a few minutes amongst your group. Yeah, 
somewhere in Mesopotamia, or at least what, in theory, would be Mesopotamia, right? I think Tom would say that the Earth looks very different at this point, um, but... There's no reason to think it's in Mesopotamia. Other than the Tigris and Euphrates, but... Well, but could those, just those are rivers. the new rivers, not the original rivers. <laughs> That's true, so... <laughs> it's going to be an outside of it is no important. More reason to think that Rome is just north of here. Right? There you go. <laughs> um, what about the who? All right, we got God, Adam, Adam Eve, 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 serpent, and I challenge one of the group. There's someone else. The animal. The animal. Yeah, okay, they're animals, but there's well, well the devil and the snake. We're gonna just okay. Yeah. Or yeah. oh, who said who said that? You know, you know who I'm asking for. Who said Jesus? Yes, good. Yes, Jesus is there, right? If you know my uh, um, the thing I get caught on is. Uh, we, brought, we should be more specific about which person of the Trinity we are speaking of. And I, I like that this is Jesus. The Holy Spirit was there. Well, yeah, the whole Trinity is there. But walking in the midst of the garden, I argue, is a Christophany. But that's, a, that's another argument we can make another time. So good. There's another, and it's right at the end. It's an offhand reference, although you won't know about it. He's got a really cool sword. The angels, right? The angels show up right at the end. But, um, I, I only spent time on that because I challenged one of the corner tables to figure out who else shows up right at the end of the story, right? It is the angels. Um, any questions about the setting? 
I mean, I think in general, this is a setting we all are at least fairly familiar with, right? We know how the Bible begins. Um, so what, I, what we're going to do is really we're just going to work our way through the questions you have, or the questions that are written down, and anything that comes up as we talk about them, we're just going to kind of take everything in turn. So, uh, because reading the Bible is a good thing. Oh, already got a question. Yes, sir. Yes, so what we know about what we know about Satan is not much. Um, we know that he was an angel, right? Name is Lucifer, light bringer, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he gets cast out, uh, or he falls from grace. Um, there's some form of a casting out, although as I mentioned offhanded in a sermon last week, right, the devil still pops up in heaven every so often, um, right, with the case of Job. Um, can't anymore, so don't worry about that. Um, when did the, the fall from grace happen, I think is really what your question is. Um, we don't know. Uh, we know it happened sometime after the seventh day, right? Well, how do we know that? Yeah, he says everything's good, right? Which would not be the case if uh, the rebellion in heaven had taken place. So it, it takes place sometime after the seven days of creation. By the way, we're not told which day of creation the angels are made. We know that they are made, right? Because that, God made everything in the, the six days of creation. But we're not told on which day angels were made, right? Because it's not relevant to us. Why is, it, why is that not relevant information? I'd like to know. I'd like to check my box. But why, why didn't the Bible tell us? Okay. It doesn't help you learn about Jesus, right? Again, let's focus on, we're focusing on Christ and everything here, right? Uh, and, right and now, how does knowing when, you know, what happens on the third day? Well, we can talk about that another time. I'm on Genesis 3, and we're already probably not going to get through it. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, so when the fall of the angels happened, um, we don't know. And I guess you could say, and again, this is probably an unsatisfactory answer, um, it takes place after the seven days of creation and before the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, that, that's what we've got. Um, so good, good question. Any other questions? I, so I, so I, how long was it from the seventh day until... The oh, see, now we, I was talking with a back group here. Um, <laughs> Well, how long do you guys think? If you had to say how long Adam and Eve were in the garden, uh, here, we'll, we'll do it this way. How many of you think Adam and Eve were in the garden less than a year? Raise your hand. I'm not raising my hand for any of these, by the way, so that you can't cheat and just say what I'm saying, right? How many of you think Adam and Eve were in the garden for more than a year, but less than five years? Oh, yes, and more than five years. Okay. Um, here's my opinion. Because this is an opinion question. Um, it's somewhat informed. Uh, we can put a lower bound on how at, they were in the garden at least this long. Adam, at the very minimum, told Eve what God told him. Right. So uh, however long it took Adam to preach the first sermon is the absolute minimum. Uh, we mentioned in this table back here, Adam's probably also naming the animals after the seventh day. So that's another little bit of a, a lower bound. I think we can place an upper bound on this as well. This is probably where the disagreement comes in. Um, I think they were there for no more than nine months. Because Adam and Eve have a command to fill the earth. And they haven't done that yet. Um, and so I think, I mean, it's, again, they're obeying the commands of God. Be fruitful and multiply. And they, again, it hasn't happened. Now, does that mean that if you find a time machine that can somehow get into the Garden of Eden and it turns out they've been there for 35 years and I'm not going to believe it? No. It really doesn't matter that much. Um, it's not a salvation issue, as it were, as to why it's not there. But my guess, based on those commands and context clues, is somewhere under a year uh, that Adam and Eve have been in the Garden. Um, if you ask me to really nail it down, I don't think they were there very long at all. I think it was this was a really quick um, fall, but I, I don't know. And if, if any of you are going to go to the grave saying Adam and Eve were there for a hundred years, fine. I'm not going to I'm not going to argue with you on that. That's just my personal opinion, and I have a microphone, so I get to voice my personal opinion uh, more than the rest of you. Good. Any other questions on our setting? Yes. 
These are the generations of the heavens and earth. What generation? Uh, which verse are you in? Two verse one. Oh, so you're in verse two. Or chapter two. It's not what we're. Um, so this is. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> see, I, I well, okay. Right. They they know what I'm about to. Okay. How many creation accounts are in Genesis 1 through 2? This is probably not a question you get very often. Seven. No, no, not three. seven. There are three. I, I argue that there are three. Some people say there are just two. Um, this is how, by the way, um, Jewish literature works, um, which is weird to us. It's foreign to us because, like it or not, you're all Greek. Um, at least your brains are Greek. Um, be, uh, unless you grew up and were, you know, taught in a non-Western society, your brain is Greek, not Hebrew. Um, we like to tell stories in a nice line, right? You start at the beginning, and then you tell us what happens next, and then the next thing, right? And it kind of goes step by step. Now. Authors do get creative, right? You got like Frankenstein, which is a story inside of another story. Eh, that's not what we're getting at here. We still tell a story more or less from beginning to end. The Hebrew people do not tell stories that way. They tell stories in circles. And I'm making a big deal out of this because if I ever teach a class on Revelation, this becomes extremely important. Uh, you can't understand. All those Atrid post millennial things that you were talking about is these people are trying to read Revelation in a straight line and it's seven circles. That one is seven. Um, so go back to Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What has God created? He's created everything, right? And Moses, who's writing this down, could have ended the creation account there. In the beginning, God created everything. In fact, we get a lot of theology just from that, right? This uh, creatio ex nihilo, right? Latin, where's Steve? He's not here today. Oh, Steve Harrison loves when I give Latin phrases in my Wednesday class. Um, it does not make him consider not coming anymore. Um, but <laughs> uh, we get all sorts of theology just from that one verse. We know a lot about God and his creation just from that. So Moses tells the entire creation account, and then the way I want you to think about it is Moses is telling you this story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's now told you a lot. He says, but wait, there's more. He hits the restart button, goes back to the beginning of the circle, and says, I want to tell you about what God did on each day. Because I want to tell you about how God created light and darkness, right? The sky and the seas, dry land and the trees, and the, the stars, the sun, the moon. Um, oh, uh, birds and fish. I almost got tripped up there, right? And then how God created land animals and created humanity, right? And then how God rested on the seventh day, right? This is why we rest on the seventh day, right? Again, you're, Moses is telling you this, right? And is that the whole creation account? Absolutely, right? It's in way more detail than the first. But then Moses says, but wait, there's something else I want to tell you about. There's something else... Here's the really important thing. How God created humans. Right? God got down into the dirt and formed man and all that kind of, all of that, right? Blew the breath of life into the clay. If, to, if you were at the early service, that's our confession absolution used that language. Right? And Moses is saying, this is about the creation of humanity, right? He's really emphasizing that. And so you get a narrowing of focus as you go through. That's what he's doing when he says these are the generations uh, of the heavens and the earth when they were created. He's, and he's transitioning from one to the other. Uh, from the, these are the seven days, now let me tell you about humanity. Um, by the way, the reason I eventually did decide to take time on this, although you saw me struggling for the sake of time, um, is because this is how the book of Revelation. Um, Revelation, the world ends about seven times. Uh, not because the world actually ends seven times, but because John, through the vision, has more to tell us and focuses on different things. Um, it's just a Jewish way of telling stories. Um, and guess what? It was Jewish people who wrote this book, so they're going to write in their way of talking. Um, but that's so that's kind of what's going on in that. Um, but, Questions on that before we get back to chapter 3? Alright. 
only chapter three from now on, um, we're going to try. I mean, my fingers might have been crossed when I said that, but we'll see. Um, tell you what, let's uh, dive in, uh, keep things moving a little bit. Can I have a volunteer to read uh, verses one through five for me? In chapter three, or only chapter three from now on. <laughs> I will tell you specifically otherwise. I'll read it. Thank you. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the fields that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Alright, so we're going to take some time here. We're going to kind of walk through the... Well, how does it phrase it, right? Each step of the temptation here. Because it's not kind of a one and done sort of thing, right? The, the devil is easing into this, right? So what is the first thing that Satan says? Uh, what kicks off this temptation, if you will? Question. Okay, a question about what? Did God really say? Right, and, I mean, hopefully you heard that as I, as I read it, right? Did God really say? Right? Uh, Satan knows what God said. He's asking Eve, right? Did God really say this? And what does he actually say? Right? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Well, what's the answer? Did God really say that? No, right? And, hey, good on Eve. She knows that. She knows that's not the case. No, I can eat of the trees of the garden, right? Just, well, I'll, I'll read it. Um, and the woman said to the servant, this is the rebuttal, if you will, we may eat of the fruit uh, of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Right? So, who wants to say it? What's going on here? What's going on with this answer Eve gives? She adds the word of God. So, right, this is the, what is the addition? Don't even touch it. Now, there are a few kind of ideas going around here. I'm just going to lay them all out to you, right? One is probably the least likely that God did actually lay a touching prohibition. He just didn't write it down. There are people who say that. I don't agree with them. The question that you then, just for the sake of uh, nailing this down, is who made the addition? Because who did Eve hear the rules from? Uh, Adam. Adam, right? That's, that was, I mean, this is pastoral ministry stuff going on here, um, right? It, well, that's it here or there. Um, Adam has been commanded to teach Eve what God told him, right? So the question is, and it's an unanswered question, is who made the, assuming it's an addition, who made the addition? Oh, we don't know in, in the end, right? I, again, you're asking for my opinion. I, I would say Adam, right? And quite frankly, we do this all the time, right? Um, you know, with kids with stoves, right? That's hot. Don't touch it. Don't even go near to it, right? But, well, you know, it's not actually going to hurt the child to get close to a hot stove. It's the touching that's the problem, right? So did Adam kind of do that? Don't even go near to it, right? The only thing that's problematic is the eating, but don't even touch it, right? Or did Eve make that addition here? I, we don't know. Um, Again, we're not even 100% sure it is an addition. I, I tend to think it is. Um, it certainly isn't the words of God that we're given. And so um, that's going on there. So uh, there's this change, if you will, to Eve and her understanding of the word of God, at least as, at least as it's given to us. Uh, what happens next? What does the serpent say? Not gonna die. Yeah, it's a no, no, that's not gonna happen, right? Have you seen anything else die around here? I mean, I, I don't know if he said anything else, but I mean, you can kind of see the the train of thought here. The servant saying, "No, no, 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 you're not gonna die," and he's so helpful, 
right? He has an explanation. Well, if I'm not going to die, then why did God tell me that? He, he you know, anticipates the question. What does he say? You'll be like God. Yeah, God's worried that if you eat that tree, you're going to be like him. Right? Now, let's pause here and actually look at this for a second. Is the devil right? Partly, I think, mean, right? Because, I mean, that's God says this later. They have become like us in every way. Is that what God says? No. No, that's what the devil is implying here, right? But they're like God in which way? But they know good and evil. Right? That's the only way that they are like God. Uh, so the devil, right, is taking half truths and twisting things here and there, right? So, oh yeah, you'll absolutely be like God, but in only the worst ways, right? <laughs> he leaves out the you know immortal, perfect, immutable, all that. Right? That that you're not going to get by eating the fruit, right? But that hey, it's opening the door. Um, let's see. Uh, and then what happens? Of course, she she eats of the fruit, right? She sees that, oh, it's a delight to the eyes, right? That what Satan says is true, uh, or at least as far as she can tell, and she eats of the fruit. So we see that Satan here is right, twisting, manipulating, half-quoting God in order to kind of, well, have the temptation. We see this happening again in the Bible, right? When, else, when do we see Satan doing this back up to his old tricks? Right, Jesus is in the wilderness, right? Now, of course, he's a... And here, here's the great question, right? They don't know that Jesus was God at that point. I, man, that's, a, that's a theoretical question. It, but uh, he, he's met his match on this one, right? He's talking... He is misquoting the word of God to the word of God, right? And Jesus calls him out on this, right? Um, there's a, a great quote from a church father. I don't remember who it is uh, off the top of my head. I can look it up. Um, if you really want to know, but it, uh, church father commenting, preaching actually, on the temptation of Christ, where uh, Satan says, you know, you, you angels will lift you up, you shall not strike your foot against the stone, right? And uh, the, the church father says, he quotes scriptures, but like an artful dodger, which is just like an old timey way of saying like a, you know, a slimy snake. He leaves out the part about how Jesus is going to smash him to pieces, right? You shall tread upon the serpent and the lion, right? That's like two verses later in the psalm that he's quoting. And Jesus, he doesn't go that direction. I mean, he could have. He said, right, my foot's not going to touch a stone while I'm pounding your face into the pavement, right? Um, <laughs> but he does it. He goes, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, right? So he, he quotes scripture against Satan. And uh, we note something here. One, Jesus is the greater Adam. Right? Where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus succeeds. Right? But we're also given, and I right, this is the what did Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And I don't like that in general, but we can glean um, life advice from this. When tempted by the devil, how should you fight back? Well, you got two examples, right? You got Adam, Eve and Adam who are kind of doing it their own way, or you got Jesus, who's God, who's using the word of God. Which one worked out better? <laughs> I mean, the, the scriptures are your only shield and sure defense against the against Satan and his attacks, right? It is to the word of God that you go. And I, I think what's worth pointing out here is more than anywhere else, you go to Christ, his death on the cross, and the forgiveness of your sins, right? Even when you do fall to the devil, Jesus is forgiving you, right? That's another one of these great temptations that we miss, Right? We all think, or maybe, maybe it's just me, right? But we all think about these temptations, right? Where the devil says, do it, right? Or don't do it, depending on what it is. Um, but we miss the other half of the temptations. I think it's not a good thing. Because they're still there and they affect us. But we don't perceive them. It's after you've done it where the devil goes, how could you have done that? <laughs> God can never forgive you. You are such a good sinner that Jesus' death, psh, not enough. Right? And that's a, that is a sneaky and a very hard temptation to overcome. I mean, spoken as I just did makes it look foolish, which is a good thing. Remember that it really is a foolish temptation. But 
be aware that when you're in the middle of it, man, that one, that one can hit hard. God doesn't love you enough. Not after what you did. I, we can see Adam and Eve react the same way. Right? Where are you, Adam? He's hiding. Why? God can never love me. Not after what I just did. I know good and evil. God's never going to love me again. Right? I need to die. That's all this God's going to do. Right? Now, whether Satan put that in their minds or whether their human nature did it doesn't matter. But we see both sides of the temptation with Adam and Eve. They're hiding saying, God can't forgive me. Of course, what does God do? Right? Well, and it's, it's this part that we skip over in, all the, or in most of the paintings of the Garden of Eden, right? You see Adam and Eve crying on their way out and they're wearing fig leaves. That's not what they were wearing on their way out. Right? They were wearing skins. Now, I'm essentially reading into it here. They're wearing lamb skins, right? They're, they're wearing the skin of a sacrifice. Right? This is God saying, I'm, I love you, Adam. I love you Eve enough. I got a way out of this. I got a way to fix this problem. Right? You try. And you fail. Don't do that again. Right? Adam and Eve, don't try and fix this problem on your own. It's too big for you. Let me fix it. And I'm going to. Right? I'm going to send from you, Eve, from your child, one who will crush the head of the serpent. And of course, his heel is bruised on the cross. Um, man, we're going to get through one question today. Uh, go ahead, Barbara. Um, in the Garden of Eden, before they ate the fruit, did they understand the word, you will die? Could you know, they had to. Have. And could they comprehend the fruit? Um, I, so, what they, what's going on in the minds of Adam and Eve, we don't know exactly. Um, What's going on in their minds in the state of innocence? I don't know. My guess is, I mean, they definitely knew, they knew the concept. I mean, Eve says, we'll die. Did they comprehend the impact? Probably not. I think my guess is that the best analogy is when you talk to very small children about death. Right? They know what death is, but they don't know. <laughs> right? They, you, they know the word. They may have some vague understanding, depending on their experiences, right? But do they really understand the implications of what's going on? No, they don't. Um, and Scripture does talk about Adam and Eve this way. They're innocent, right? And that kind of has a double meaning, right? Yes, they're without sin, but they also are without knowledge, right? They are child, they're childlike in their innocence, which is... Interestingly enough, is why it is the reason why you, why we're not going back to the garden. Now, hear, hear me carefully with this. A lot of the elements of the garden are returning. But what is not returning? Your childlike innocence. You'll still know good and evil in eternal life. Right? You are elevated in that way. You know more than you used to. Right? And there's all sorts of other reasons why eternal life is better than the garden. Right? We don't actually want to go back to what Adam and Eve have. What we will have will be better than that. Now, we're still, it's a return to the garden in the sense of perfection, in the sense of the relationship with God, and all of those sorts of ways. But the innocence is lost. The innocence in that sort of sense, right? The fruit cannot be uneaten. We'll always have this knowledge of good and evil, but now we also know grace and forgiveness and those sorts of things. And so our state will be better than that of Adam and Eve from the garden. Um, not the same. Better. Good. Anything else? Any other questions on this section? Go ahead, Bill. No? Uh, I, I, I saw the question. That it went, I saw it go back, too. Anyway. Um, so I have a question for all of you, just because the pet peeve of mine is going to drive me nuts um, if I don't say anything. Um, how many, first of all, how many of you have Lutheran Study Bibles with you right now? With me? No. Well, that you can look at. Does it tell you what kind of fruit no. the knowledge, the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil is? No. It does. Did they take it out? Oh, good. They used to. Um, it was one of the, it was one of the areas, one of like two notes in the Lutheran study Bible. I did not like at all. Um, how many of you have heard that you know the very erudite individuals among us? Well, Adam and Eve most certainly were not eating an apple. Right. This is for foolish children to think that it's an apple. And then, without fail, what comes next? 
This was far more likely a pomegranate. No, it wasn't! Do you know how I know it's not a pomegranate? No. Does eating a pomegranate give you knowledge of good and evil? No. You do not have access. This is a fruit you have never seen. You never will see. Right? This is a, a completely other tree. So, no. Don't find anyone who says, it wasn't an apple. It was probably a pomegranate. Or some other Middle Eastern fruit. And have think, you ever taken a bite of a pomegranate? I mean, <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, yeah, it's, uh, it's unpleasant. <laughs> that is true. But I, don't take people who say those sorts, because the reason they're saying it is to make themselves look smarter than they are. Um, which I know that it's smarter than they are, because if they were that smart, they wouldn't be saying pomegranate. Anyway, there's a pet peeve of mine drives me absolutely nuts. If you've thought this in the past, that is okay. You are forgiven. Absolution <laughs> is yours. Like I said, you could have read it in the Lutheran Study Bible. It wasn't a note in previous editions. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's not there anymore because that's a, it's, it's not a pomegranate, guys. Um, anyway, sorry. That's that's a Pastor Berlinski's soapbox. It drives me nuts um, when people say it. So now you know. And so you won't do it unless you're doing it on purpose, which um, I might revoke the absolution in that case. <laughs> we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. All right. That one sparks conversation. Oh um, let's see. Uh, let's go to a volunteer for verses 7 through... Tell you what. I don't know why they skipped one verse. Who wants to read verse 6 through 13? You may as well read it's one verse. It's not that long. Thanks, Steve. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was in, uh, to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made them... Loin, made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man said to his wife, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord got among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the woman, to the man, and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said, God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I All right. I'll turn my mic off. But here we go. Um, so, just as we trace the temptation, let's run through the reaction of Adam. They eat the fruit, which is not a pomegranate, nor is it an apple. Um, they eat the fruit, and they their eyes are open. They realize that they were naked. What's the first thing that they do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Fig leaves. So the fig leaves, right? They try and cover things up. Right? They, they recognize this about themselves. They try, their innocence is replaced with guilt and shame, and they try and cover themselves up. Obviously, insufficient. Right, um, the, the leaves are never going to be enough to cover up the guilt of sin and uh, the shame that comes with it. What happens next? So they sow the fig leaves, then they hide. Right? They run from God. Again, this is that second half of the temptation going on. Whether the devil said it or whether it's just their own conscience saying, I gotta get away. All right? God is a judgmental God. And he is. He's a righteous God. You have to be right, be perfect like my father in heaven is perfect. Like your father in heaven is perfect. That's a that's a big standard. And it's the real standard, right? Jesus is not being hyperbolic when he says that. So Adam and Eve, they run, they hide. Uh, but obviously, right, God asks some questions here. There's a, an author that wrote a book about questions that God answered. You can find it on Amazon. Um, is, uh, when God asks the questions, as I told my Wednesday night group, buy two, one for each eye. They're not even that expensive, right? You buy them for your friends, all of that kind of stuff. Um, in case you're wondering, the author is a uh, Josepha Leckie. 
Um, it's an excellent book. Uh, and some of you may know him. Um, <laughs> we've got to ask some questions he knows the answers to. Right? We've got to never ask a question he doesn't know the answer Un to. Unsolicited commercial. That, that is true. He, I don't know if you saw him shrink into nothing or attempt to when I started that. But no, he, uh, he did not solicit that. Um, right? and, and nor is it a paid sponsorship. Right? <laughs> So, uh, but no, dude, I, I highly recommend the book. It's, uh, it's very good. Um, and, uh, well, what do Adam and Eve do when they're asked these questions? They don't take accountability. Right, they deflect. Right? In, in fact, who do they deflect to? The serpent. Uh, yes, but that's not really who they're deflecting. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, all the implications. I mean, Adam is very obvious. Here, oh, yeah. Right? Oh, and you gave me. I, he doesn't, I mean, he kind of blames the woman, but the one he's really laying the blame on is God. He's like, God, everything was fine until you gave me this woman. Now he's ignoring oh, the loneliness thing, right? That was a big problem. But Adam is blaming God. And in a lesser way, Eve is too, right? And God created the serpent. Um, but no matter what, Adam and Eve are deflecting, right? Go ahead. Just one thing, sorry. Yeah, the, the the implication, right? So this is the end of verse seven, right, uh, or verse six, rather. She took the fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, right? It does not say that Eve went running miles and miles to where Adam was. Uh, to get. By the way, this is uh, Milton gets this wrong, right? How many of you have read Paradise Lost? Okay, that's a better percentage than when I asked about the Divine Comedy in my Wednesday night class. You have a reading assignment. Go read Paradise Lost. It's very good, but it's not, I mean, it's quasi-biblical, right? But in Paradise Lost, Adam's like in a house far away, and the devil sees that Eve's alone and goes, Oh, the weaker sex, I'll get them now. Old cues. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, that is not the case. Right? Either that or the simple reading of this text is not the correct reading. Right? Adam is right there next to Eve. Uh, he's certainly close enough that he, she didn't have to go anywhere to give him the fruit. He is just as complicit in this as she is. Right? And note, who does God blame for this? I mean, eventually he does blame the servant. Right? That, that is important. Right? But who does he go to first? Right? Adam. You got an answer. I, I suspect, right, here's a, a theory question, man, we're, we got through like a question and a half, that's pretty good. Um, I, I suspect that even if Adam hadn't eaten the fruit, even if when Eve handed it to him, he said, no, I still think God would have gone after Adam. What? What's Adam's responsibility? It's take care of her, right? That's the, he he should have stepped in, and he didn't, right? So, and even, of course, well, even the eating of the fruit, Adam is still culpable here, and he's still the one responsible. That's that's the role he's been given. Um, <laughs> You're going to be in trouble if you don't stop. Oh, I know, that's right. Oh, I, I have three baptisms. Okay, real quick. I'm going to... This is the... I forgot to do my homework the night before, so I need to get the answers done quick. Um, after cursing Satan, God now curses the world's creation. What curses to God's place on woman? That's the pain in childbirth bearing. The ground, thorns and thistles. Um, I think shoes fall in that category as well. If you know, you know. And all people will return to the earth. Uh, question five. Why did God send Adam and Eve away from the Garden of Eden? Well, so they don't eat from the tree of life and live eternally in their sin. It's gospel. Uh, it's a gospel reason that he does that. Um, and tell you what, the other ones don't have numbers, so I'm going to let you do those on your own. <laughs> Look at that! All right! If you have any other questions, come find me when I'm not busy sometime this afternoon. I uh, we'll certainly have time for questions. Post them on the Facebook. Uh, we'll, this video will also be up on YouTube. Post them there. Email one of us. All that kind of stuff. We'll make Pastor Jordan answer all your questions next week. Um, or you can come find me and talk to me. That works as well. So, let's tell you what. I close all my Wednesday classes with the Lord's Prayer. And I think that's what you guys do here. But I'm going to mix it up. And so I'm going to invite you all to please stand. And I know you've done this before so that we can sing the doxology together.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Go out and do good. If you're if you're up to me. Oh, I always do. Well, I. <laughs> <laughs> you're the alcoholic.